The Odyssey, Book 24, the ghost of the suitors in Hades, Odysseus and his men go to the house of Laertes, the people of Ithaca come out to attack, Odysseus of Athena concludes a peace, then Hermes of Pymene summoned the ghost of the suitors, and in his hand he held the fair golden wand, with which he seals men's eyes in sleep, or wakes them just as he pleases, with this he roused the ghost and led them, while they followed whining and gibbering behind him, as bats fly squealing in the hollow of some great cave, when one of them has fallen out of the cluster in which they hang, even so did the ghost whine and squeal as Hermes, the healer of sorrow, led them down into the dark abode of death. When they had passed the waters of Oceanus and the rock Lucas, they came to the gates of the sun in the land of dreams, whereon they reached the meadow of Asphodel, where dwell the souls and shadows of them that can labor no more. Here they found the ghost of Achilles, the son of Peleus, with those of Patroclus, Antilochus, and Ajax, who was the finest and handsomest man of all the demands after the son of Peleus himself. They gathered round the ghost of the son of Peleus, and the ghost of Agamemnon joined them, sorrowing bitterly. Round him were gathered also the ghosts of those who had perished with him in the house of Aegisthus. The ghost of Achilles spoke first. So, Atreus, it said, we used to say that Zeus had loved you better from first to last than any other hero, for you were captain over many brave men when we were all fighting together before Troy, yet they had of death which no mortal can escape, was laid upon you all too early, better for you had fallen at Troy in the heyday of your renown, for the Athens would have built a mound over your ashes, and your son would have been heir to your good name, whereas it had been now your lot to come to a most miserable end. Happy son of Peleus, answered the ghost of Agamemnon, for having died at Troy, far from Argos, while the bravest of the Trojans and the Urchins fell round you, fighting for your body. There you lay in the whirling clouds of dust, all huge and hugely, heedless now of your chivalry. We fought for the whole of the live long day, nor should we ever have left off of Zeus, had not sent a hurricane to stay us. Then, when we had borne you to the ships out of the prey, we laid you on your bed and cleansed your fair skin with warm water and with ointments. The dawns tore their hair and wept bitterly round about you. Your mother, when she heard, came with her immortal nymphs from out of the sea, and a sound of great wailing went forth over the waters so that the Urchians quaked for fear. They would have fled panic-stricken to their ships, had not wise old master, whose counsel was ever truest, Checked them, saying, Hold, Argive, supply not some Urchians. This is his mother coming from the sea, with her immortal nymphs to view the body of her son. Thus he spoke, and Urchians feared no more. The daughters of the old man of the sea stood round you, weeping bitterly, clothed you in immortal raiment. The nine muses also came and lifted up their sweet voices in lament, calling and answering one another. There was not an Argive that wept her pity of the dirge that they chanted. Days and nights, seven and ten, we mourned you mortals and immortals. But on the eighteenth day, we gave you to the flames, and many a fat sheep, with a many an ox, did we slay and sacrifice around you. You were burnt in raiment of the gods, with rich resins and with honey, while heroes, horse and but clashed their armor around the pile as you were burning with the tramp as of a great multitude. But when the flames of heaven had done their work, we gathered your white bones at daybreak and laid them in ointments and then pure wine. Your mother brought us a golden vase to hold them, a gift of Bacchus, and work of Hephaestus himself. In this we mingled your bleached bones with those of Patroclus, who had gone before you, and separate who we enclosed also those of Antilochus, who had been closer to you than any other of your comrades, and that Patroclus was no more. Over these, the host of the Argives built a noble tomb, on a point of jutting out over the open Hellespont, that it might be seen from far out upon the sea by those now living and by them that shall be born hereafter. Your mother begged prizes from the gods, and offered them to be contended for the nobles of Urchins. You must have been present at the funeral of many your hero, when the young men gird themselves and make ready to contend for prizes on the death of some great chieftain. But you never saw such prizes as silver-footed Thetis, offered in your honor, for the gods love you well. Thus even in death your fame, Achilles, has not been lost, and your name lives evermore among all mankind. But as for me, what solace had I when the days of my fighting were done? For Zeus willed my destruction on my return, by the hands of Ugyphus, and those of my wicked wife. Plus they converse, and presently Hermes came up to them with the ghost of the suitors, who had been killed by Odysseus, the ghost of Agamemnon, and Achilles were astonished at seeing them, went up to them at once. The ghost of Agamemnon recognized Amphidon, son of Melanias, who lived in Ithaca and had been his host, so it began to talk to him. Amphidon, it said, what has happened to all you fine young men, all of an age too, that you are come down here under the ground? One could pick a finer body of men from any city. Did Poseidon raise his winds and waves against you when you were at sea, or did your enemies make an end of you on the mainland when you were cattle lifting or sheep stealing, or while fighting in defense of their wives and city? Answer my question, for I have been your guest. Do you not remember how I came to your house of Menelaus to persuade Odysseus to join us with the ships against Troy? It was a whole month ere we could resume our voyage, for we had hard work to persuade Odysseus to come with us. And the ghost of Amphimedon answered Agamemnon, son of Atreus, king of men, I remember everything that you have said and will tell you fully and accurately about the way in which our end was brought about. Odysseus had been long gone, and we were courting his wife, who did not say point blank that she would not marry, nor yet bring measures to an end, for she meant to compass our destruction. This, then, was the trick she played us. She set up a great tambour frame in her room and began to work on enormous piece of fine needlework. Sweethearts, said she, Odysseus is indeed dead. Still, do not press me to marry again immediately. Wait, for I would not have my skill in needlework perish unrecorded, till I have completed a pall for the hero Laratus. Against the time when death shall take him, he is very rich, and women of the place will talk if he is laid out about a pall. This is what she said, and we assented, whereupon we could see her working upon her great web all day long. But at night she would unpick the stitches again by torchlight. She fooled us in this way for three years without our finding it out. But as time wore on, she was now in her fourth year in the waning of moons, and many days had been accomplished. One of her maids, who knew what she was doing, told us, and we caught her in the act of undoing her work. So she had to fish it whether she would or no. And when she showed us the rope she had made after she had it washed, its splendor was that of the sun or moon. Then some malicious god conveyed Odysseus to the upland farm where his swineherd lives. 
Thither, presently, came his, also his son, returning from a voyage to Pylos, and the two came to the town when they had hatched their plot for our destruction. Telemachus came first, and then after him, accompanied by the swineherd, came Odysseus, clad in rags and leaning on the staff as though he were some miserable old beggar. He came so unexpectedly that none of us knew him, not even the older ones among us, and we reviled him and threw things at him. He endured both being struck and insulted without a word, and though he was in his own house, but with the will of Aegis bearing Zeus and slaughtered him, he and Telemachus took the armor and hid it in the inner chamber, bolting the doors behind him, and then he cunningly made his wife offer his bow and a quantity of iron to be contended for by us ill-fated suitors, and this was the beginning of our end, for not one of us could string the bow, nor nearly do so. When it was about to reach the hands of Odysseus, we all of us shouted out that it should not be given him, no matter what he might say, but Telemachus insisted on his having it. When he had got it in his hands, he strung it with ease and sent his arrow through the iron. Then he stood on the floor of the cloister and poured his arrows on the ground, glaring fiercely about him. First he killed Antios, and then aiming straight before him, he let his fly. His deadly darts, they fell thick on one another. It was plain that someone of the gods was helping them, for they fell upon us with might and main throughout the cloisters, and there was a hideous sound of groaning as our grains were being battered in, and the ground seized with our blood. This Agamemnon is how we came by our end, and our bodies are lying still uncared for in the house of Odysseus, or our friends at home do not yet know what has happened, so that they cannot lay us out and wash the black blood from our wounds, making moan over us according to offices due to the departed. Happy Odysseus, son of Laretus, replied the ghost of Agamemnon, you are indeed blessed in the possession of a wife endowed with such rare excellence of understanding, and so faithful to her wedded lord as Penelope, the daughter of Icarus. The fame, therefore, of her virtue shall never die, and immortals shall compose a song that shall be welcomed to all mankind in honor of the constancy of Penelope. How far otherwise is the weakness of the daughter of Teen Darius, who killed her lawful husband, her song shall be hateful among men, for she has brought disgrace on all womankind, even on the good ones. Thus did they converse in the house of Hades, deep down within the bowels of the earth. Meanwhile, Odysseus and the others passed out of the town and soon reached the fair and well-tailed farm of Laertes, which he had reclaimed with infinite labor. Here was his house with Aline to running all round it, where the slaves who worked for him slept and sat and ate. While indeed the house there was an old Sicilian woman who looked after him in his own country farm. When Odysseus got there, he said to his son and to the other two, Go to the house and kill the best pig that you can find for dinner. Meanwhile, I want to see whether my father will know me and or fail to recognize me after so long an absence. When he took off his armor and gave it to Eumaeus and Cleotus, who went straight on to the house while he turned off into the vineyard to make trial of his father. As he went down to the great orchard, he did not see Dolius nor any of his sons nor of the other bondsmen, for they were all gathering thorns to make offense for the vineyard at the place where the old man had told them. He therefore found his father alone, holding a vine. He had on a dirty old shirt patched with very shabby. His legs were bound around the thongs of ox to save him from the brambles, and he also wore sleeves of leather. He had a goatskin cap on his head, and he was looking very woebegone. When Odysseus saw him so worn, so old, in full sorrow, he still stood under a tall pear tree and began to weep. He doubted whether to embrace and kiss him and tell him all about his having come home, or whether he should first question him and see what he would say. In the end, he deemed it best to be crafty with him. So in this mind, he went up to his father, who was bending down and digging about the plants. I see, sir, said Odysseus, that you are an excellent gardener. What pains you take with it, to be sure. There is not a single plant, nor a fig tree, vine, olive, pear, nor flower bed, but bears the trace of your attention. I trust, however, that you will not be offended if I say that you take better care of your garden than yourself. You are old, unsavory, and very meanly clad. It cannot be because you are idle that your master takes such poor care of you. Indeed, your face and figure have nothing of the slave about them and proclaim you of noble birth. I should have said that you were one of those who should wash well, eat well, and lie soft at night, as old men have a right to do so. But tell me and tell me true whose bondman are you and in whose garden are you working? Tell me about another matter. Is this place that I have come to really is a cup? I met a man just now who said so, but he was a dull fellow and had not the patience to hear my story out when I was asking him about an old friend of mine, whether he was still living or was already dead in the house of Hades. Believe me when I tell you that this man came to my house once when I was in my own country, and never yet did any stranger come to me whom I liked better. He said that his family came from Ithaca, and his father was Laretes, son of Arcesias. I received him hospitably, making him welcome to all the abundance of my house, and when he went away, I gave him all customary presents. I gave him seven talents of fine gold, and a cup of solid silver with flowers chased upon it. I gave him twelve white cloaks, as many pieces of tapestry. I also gave him twelve cloaks with single fold, twelve rugs, twelve fair mantles, and an equal number of shirts. To all this I added for a good-looking woman, skilled in all useful arts, and I let him take his choice. His father shed tears and answered, Sir, you have indeed come to the country that you have named, but it has fallen into the hands of wicked people. All this month of presence has been given to no purpose. If you could have found your friend here alive in Ithaca, he would have entertained you hospitably, and would have requited your presence amply. When you left him, as would have been only right, considering what you had already given him, but tell me and tell me true, how many years is it since you entertained this guest? My unhappy son, as ever was, alas, he has perished far from his own country. The fishes of the sea have eaten him, or he has fallen prey to the birds and wild beasts of some continent. Neither his mother nor his father, who were his parents, could throw over our arms about him and wrap him in his shroud. Now, or could his excellence, richly dowered wife, Penelope, bewail her husband, as was natural upon his deathbed, and close his eyes according to the offices due to the departed? But now tell me truly, for I want to know, who and whence are you? Tell me of your town and parents. Where is the ship lying that has brought you and your men to Ithaca? Or were you a passenger on some other man's ship, and those who brought you here have gone on their way and left you? I will tell you everything, answered Odysseus, quite truly. I come from Aliabas, where I have a fine house. I am son of King Aphidias, who is the son of Polypanon. My name is Epiritas. Heaven drove me off my course as I was leaving Scania. And I have been carried here against my will. As for my ship, it is lying over yonder off the open country outside the town. This is the fifth year since Odysseus left my country. Poor fellow, yet the omens were good for him. When he left me, the birds all flew over our right hands, and both he and I rejoiced to see them as we parted, for we had every hope that we should have another friendly meeting and exchange presents. A dark cloud of sorrow fell upon their as he listened. He filled both hands with dust from off the ground and poured it over his gray head, rolling heavily as he did so. The heart of Odysseus was touched, and his nostrils quivered as he looked upon his father, and he sprang towards him, flung his arms about him and kissed him, saying, I am he, father, about whom you are asking. I have returned after having been away for
time to lose, for I should tell you that I have been killing the Sufis in my house to punish them for the insolence and crimes. If you are really my son, Ulysses, replied Larathus, and have come back again, you must give me such manifest proof of your identity as shall convince me. First observe the scar, answered Ulysses, which I got from a boar's tusk when I was hunting on Mount Parnassus. You and my mother had sent me to Autolycus and my father, mother's father to receive the presents which when we had was over here he had promised to give me. Furthermore, I will point out to you the trees in the vineyard which you gave me, and I asked you all about them as I followed you around the garden. We went over them all, and you told me their names, and what they all were. You gave me thirteen pear trees, ten apple trees, forty fig trees. You also said you would give me fifty rows of vines. These are corn planted between each row, and they yield grapes of every kind when the heat of heaven has been laid heavy upon them. Lyratus' strength failed him when he heard the convincing proofs his son had given him. He threw his arms about him and Odysseus to support him, or he would have gone off into a swoon. But as soon as he came to, he was beginning to recover his senses. He said, O oh, Father Zeus, then you gods are still in all this after all, if the suitors have really been punished for their insolence and folly. Nevertheless, I am much afraid that I shall have all the townspeople of Ithaca appear directly, and they will be sending messengers everywhere throughout the cities of Cephalanians. Odysseus answered, Take heart and do not trouble yourself about that, but let us go into the house hard by your garden. I have already told Talbacus and Leotis Unias to go on there and get dinner ready as soon as possible. Thus conversing, the two made their way towards the house. When they got there, they found Talbacus with a stockman in the swine for cutting up meat and mixing wine and water. And the old Sicil woman took Laratus inside and washed her and anointed him with oil. She put him on a good cloak, and Athena came up to him and gave him a more imposing presence, making him taller and stouter than before. When he came back, his son was surprised to see him looking so like an immortal, and said to him, My dear father, some one of the gods has been making you much taller and better looking. Laratus answered, Would it by father Zeus, Athena, and Apollo that I were the man I was when I ruled among the Cephalanians and took near from that strong fortress on the foreland, if I were still what I then was, and I had been in your house yesterday with my armor on, I should have been able to stand by you and help you against the suitors. I should have killed a great many of them, and you would have rejoiced to see it. Thus did they converse with others when they had finished their work and feast was ready, left off working, and took each his proper place on the benches and seats. But then they began eating. By and by, old Dolius and his sons left their work and came up for their mother, the Cicel woman, who was looked after Laratus. Now that he was growing old, had been to fetch them. When they saw Odysseus, when were certain it was he, they stood there lost in astonishment. But Odysseus scolded them good naturedly and said, Sit down to your dinner, old man, and never mind about your surprise. We have been wanting to begin for some time, have been waiting for you. Then Dolius put out both his hands and went up to Odysseus. Sir, said he, seizing his master's hand and kissing it at the wrist, we have had long been wishing you home, and now heaven has restored you to us after we have given up hoping. All hail, therefore, and may the gods cross for you. But tell me, does Penelope already know of your return, or shall we send someone to tell her? Old man answered Odysseus. She knows already, so you need not trouble about that. On this he took his seat, and the sons of Dolius gathered round Odysseus as to give him greeting and embrace him one after the other. When they took their seats into order near Dolius, their father, while they were thus busy, getting their dinner ready, rumor was around the town, and noise about the terrible fate that had befallen the suitors. As soon, therefore, as the people heard of it, they gathered from every quarter, groaning and hooting before the house of Odysseus. They took the dead away, buried every man his own, and put the bodies of those who came from elsewhere on board the fishing vessels, for the fishermen to take each of them to his own place. They then met angrily in the place of assembly, and when they were got together, Eupatheus rose to speak. He was overwhelmed with grief for the death of his son Antinous, who had been the first man killed by Odysseus. So he said, Weeping bitterly, my friends, this man has done Odysseus great wrong. He took many of our best men away with him in his police, and he has lost both ships and men. Now, moreover, on his return, he has been killing all the foremost men among the Cephalanians. Let us be up and doing before he can get away to Pylos, or to Elias, where the Epians rule, or we shall be ashamed of ourselves forever afterwards. It will be an everlasting disgrace to us if we do not avenge the murder of our sons and brothers. For my own part, I should have have no more pleasure in life, but had rather die at once. Let us be up and then after them before they can cross over to the mainland. He wept as he spoke, and over every one pitied him. But Madame and the bard of Themis had now woke up and came to them from the house of Odysseus. Every one was astonished at seeing them, but they stood in the middle of the assembly. And Madame said, Hear me, Madame, if Odysseus did not do these things against the will of heaven. I myself saw an immortal god take the form of mentor and stand beside him. This god appeared now in front of him, encouraging him, and now going furiously about the court and attacking the suitors, whereon they fell thick on one another. On this pale fear laid hold of them, and old Halitherosis, son of Maxor, rose to speak, for he was the only man among them who knew both past and future. So he spoke to them painfully, and in the honestly saying, Men of Ithaca, it is all your own fault that these things have turned out as they have. You will not listen to me, nor yet to mentor, when we bade you take the fault of your sons who were doing much wrong in the wantonness of their hearts, wasting the substance and dishonoring the wife of a chieftain who they thought would not return. Now, however, let it be as I say, and do as I tell you. Do not go out against Odysseus, or you may find that you have been drawing down evil on your own heads. This was what he said, and more than half raised the loud shouts in that once left assembly, but the rest stayed where they were, for the speech of Alice of Paris displeased them, and they sided with Epithesis. They therefore hurried off before their armor, and when they had armed themselves, they met together in front of the city, and Epithesis led them on in their folly. He thought that he was going to avenge the murder of his son, whereas in truth he was never to return, but was himself to perish in his attempt. Then Athena said to Zeus, while there's of Saturn, king of kings, answer me this question, why do you propose to do? Will you set them fighting still further, or will you make peace between them? And Zeus answered, my child, why should you ask me? Was it not by your own arrangement that Odysseus came home and took his revenge upon the suitors? To every lie but I will tell you what I think will be most reasonable arrangement. Now that Odysseus is revenged, let them swear to solemn covenants, in virtue of which we shall continue to rule, while we cause the others to forgive and forget the massacre of their sons and brothers. Let them then all become friends, as here three four, and let peace and plenty reign. This was what Athena was already eager to bring about, so down she darted from the topmost summits of Olympus. Now when Laratus and others had done dinner, Odysseus began by saying, some of you go out and see if they are getting close enough to us. So one of all these sons, and went as he was bid, standing on the threshold, he could see them all quite near, and said, Odysseus, here they are, let us put on our armor at once. They put on their armor as fast as they could, and that is to say, Odysseus and his 
agreement in the Six Sons of Dolius. Lyrus has also and Dolius did the same warriors by necessity in spite of their gray hair. When they had all put on their armor, they opened the gates and sallied forth. Odysseus leading the way. Then Zeus's daughter, Athena, came up to them, having assumed the form and voice of mentor. Odysseus was glad when he saw her and said to his son, Telemachus, Telemachus, now that you are about to fight in an engagement, which will show every man's mental, be sure not to disgrace your ancestors, who were eminent in for their strength and courage all the world over. You say truly, my dear father, answered Telemachus, and you shall see, if you will, that I am in no mind to disgrace your family. Lyrus was delighted when he heard this good heavens, he exclaimed, What a day I'm enjoying. I do indeed rejoice at it. My sons and grandsons are vying with one another in a matter of valor. On this, Athena came close up to him and said, Son of Astrocysius, yes, best friend I have in the world, praise the blue eyed damsel, and to Zeus, her father, then poised your spear and hurled it. As she spoke, she infused fresh vigor into him, and when he had prayed to her, he poised the spear and hurled it. He hit Eupithias' helmet, and the spear went right through it, for that helmet stayed it not, and armor rang rattling round him as he fell heavily to the ground. Meantime, Odysseus and his son fell upon the front line of the foe and smote them with their swords and spears. Indeed, they would have killed every one of them and prevented them from ever getting home again. Only Athena raised her voice aloud and made everyone pause. Men of Ithaca, she cried, cease this dreadful war and still matter at once a further bloodshed. On this pale fear seized everyone, they were so frightened that their arms dropped from their hands and fell upon the bandits and the goddess's voice. They fled back to the city for their lives. But Odysseus gave a great cry, gathering himself together, swimming down like a soaring eagle, and the son of Saturn set a thunderbolt of fire that fell for just in front of Athena. And so she said to Odysseus, Odysseus, noble son of Laratus, stop this war fell strife. Of Zeus will be angry with you. Thus spoke Athena, and Odysseus obeyed her gladly. Then Athena assumed the form of the voice of mentor and presently made a covenant peace between the two contending parties.